Good morning, everybody. It has been a crazy couple of days here on the farm, and I want to tell you all about it. But first, let's say good morning to our large white farm dog. Good morning, guys. Hi. Hi. How's it going, Toby? How's it going, Abby? Toby Dog's doing his customary marking of the fence post. Abby Dog is her usual full of energy self. And yes, this morning, everything kind of feels just right here on the farm. I've been making a lot of progress over the past few days. In particular, you know, one of the goals I had for this summer season was to actually start Start growing food for my birds inside the hoop coop. You know, the idea being that essentially in the winter months, my ducks, geese, and chickens would live inside that structure because it's nice and warm and it's great for them for protection in the winter. And then in the summer months, though, I would clean it out and put all sorts of food stuff inside of there. And while I am happy to report that it is pretty much fully planted right now, and what I wanted to do is really show you guys what things are looking like inside of there because uh, I'm pretty excited. So yes, come with me right this way. We'll check things out. All right, here it is. Here's what things are looking like right now. Actually, while I talk to you guys, I'm gonna do this first and just get this going. And despite the fact that regular viewers of our YouTube channel are familiar with this, my name is Morgan Gold. This farm is called Goldshaw Farm, and we raise ducks, goose, cattle, trees, pigs, chickens, and maybe a few other things in terms of our actual farming operations. Now, this 100 foot by 20 foot hoop house structure that I'm in right now was something that I built last year with the help of my buddy Alfred. My buddy Alfred! And like I said, it's meant to be winter housing for the birds. And as far as the bedding, goes typically what i'm doing is i'm putting straw down on the ground and the birds during the winter months are going to poop in it but the straw acts as a carbonaceous diaper and captures and sequesters all of that poop and eventually that combination of straw and poop breaks down and turns into wonderful, wonderful compost. And as I was designing this structure, part of the design requirement was, was to have a structure that had a large bay door that I could ultimately fit my tractor into because the other day I came in here with my tractor and I just cleaned this whole thing out. Ultimately, over the course of about six months, I had accumulated, I don't know, it was about six, maybe eight inches of actual bedding, but even that bedding probably got pressed down and some of it even broke down and turned into compost by the time that we were done. So the stuff that I'd put in there, say, in October, was clearly just broken down in nice, good black soil. And so with the mechanical help of that tractor, it took me about, I don't know, 45 minutes to an hour to clean it out. But the crazy thing is, if you actually look at it, I have this gigantic mountain of compost. So yes, if you ever wondered, what does it look like when you compost the poop of about 22 geese, 25 ducks, and I don't know, 20 chickens or so over the span of about six months. This is what it looks like. And so yes, I've made this gigantic mountain that is gonna still sit here for probably another few more months. I'm just gonna let this keep breaking it down. I'll probably continue to use my tractor to turn this over at some point later this summer. But yes, I'm very pleased with how this has turned into good usable compost. But then the other really exciting factor about all of this is I now have some cleared out growing space. Now the truth of the matter is I'm a little bit behind the eight ball here in how I'm building this because I should have had it planted maybe two or three weeks ago if I was going on my farm plan schedule that I made over the winter. But because hatching season and laying season really dragged on and I wanted to do my best to maximize that time period, I didn't rush to kick all the birds out. And by kick all the birds out, I mean all of our adult ducks and geese are now living out here in the permaculture orchard. They are wandering this area full time at this point and it's pretty gratifying to see what they're doing out there. I'll show you what's going on back there in a little bit but the fact of the matter is at this point inside the yard I'm standing in now there are no adult birds and I have no plans to let my adult birds back in here until I don't know probably late October November something like that it's also weather dependent like essentially I'm just waiting until winter hits and as you guys saw in a recent video even my large mobile egg laying coop which is actually now now up on the top of that hill. I mean, can you guys see it way, way up there? Side note, would you look at Toby Dog watching over his birds? He loves protecting those guys. He can't get to that pasture from that paddock, but he can get to that pasture from this paddock, which is usually where he's spending his time. You can see there's like a little doggy door. Well, now with the egg coop up on the top of the hill, I thought I had all of my chickens out of here and I had only left my weird chickens in this spot for them to have a chance to kind of pick through and be protected by the fence, but at the same time, get a chance to explore. Well, I will say that one of the things I noticed was there was still one chicken hanging out. You still keep doing this, why? What's up with you, girl? Yes, the chicken who I've nicknamed Runaway Red over the years, who then has become 
Captain Janeway. She is now floating around, and I decided because of her weird broody habits that I was gonna put her in with the weird chickens, who if you guys are wondering where the weird chickens are right now, their weird chicken coop is right there. I keep my weird chickens separate from my other chickens because they're much smaller, and I'm always worried that the other chickens are gonna beat them up. When I first introduced Captain Janeway to the weird chickens, she wanted nothing to do with those weird chickens. But at this point, she really has become a part of the flock. And speaking of the part of the flock, there's been some other changes too, but that's gonna be a conversation for a future video. But with all of the birds now removed, it was time to get into the hoop coop and start planting. You know, like I said, I was a little bit behind schedule, but earlier this spring, I started a whole bunch of seedlings inside our house. Most of those seedlings were intended for my wife Allison's kitchen garden, but I also planted a massive amount of pumpkins because one of the most important things that I wanna plant for my animals are pumpkins. You know, pumpkins are a great feed for the birds, like the ducks, geese, and chickens all love them. The seeds actually have a decent amount of protein. The rest of the fruit is actually just good calories for them. I also plan to feed my cattle a little bit of pumpkins this fall as a way to help them with a natural dewormer. And in case you're wondering, I'm not sure if the pigs are going to be around long enough for the pumpkins to be harvested we'll see but if they're still here on the farm they will get a taste now like i said i waited a little bit longer than i would have liked to and so some of these pumpkins are not looking great you know they were in their little seedling pots for a little bit too long and so some of them got a bit root bound i probably could have should have found a better way to get them out here sooner you know the thing is you only have so much time in the spring for various projects and priorities and how they slot and synchronize can sometimes force you to do things that are less than ideal. So for example, my single biggest priority here on the farm was actually getting my fence completed so I could get my cattle and chickens into the upper pasture. When I was making my farm plans for this year, that was priority number one without a doubt. And so I made that the most important thing that I was working on. The other thing that I had going on was duck and goose laying season is a really big thing for us from a financial standpoint. And so I didn't want to cut that too short because that would mean fewer goslings or that would mean fewer eggs that were selling. And so so I waited as long as I could in here. The downside to that was I probably started my seedlings a little bit too early. And the lesson I have for next year is to wait a little bit longer because, you know, probably by mid-June is when I want to have this area cleared out. And so I just need to be thinking that I won't plant until mid-June. Now, for most gardening activities here in northern Vermont where we're zone four, that might seem a little bit late, but because I have the beauty of this hoop coop, it's gonna keep things warmer longer. And so I have this luxury of having a later growing season too. So as you can see, I do have things like these pumpkin seedlings. Oh, Abby, you're killing the pumpkin seedling. No, oh, puppy dog, come on. So yes, I have things like these pumpkin seedlings that are looking a little peaky, but they're bouncing back. Ever since I put them in here over I don't know, I guess it was three days ago. They seem like they're bouncing back. And so food crop number one that I'm growing for my birds are those pumpkin seedlings. And then the other thing you'll notice is you can see these little black lines that I turned on just a couple minutes ago. That's how I'm watering them. They're just basic drip hoses that I got at the discount store. So far they're working pretty okay, but I think I'm actually gonna switch it up pretty soon and eventually just put in a sprinkler system and have a couple of sprinklers going because it's gonna be easier because that wasn't the only thing I planted here on the farm. The other thing that I did was once I got my pumpkins in place, and there's actually a few cabbages too that I had left over that didn't go into Allison's garden. But once I finished that, I started to broadcast seed a whole bunch of buckwheat. If you guys aren't familiar, buckwheat is often used as a cover crop. It's like kind of like a grain. I think technically though, it's not like a cereal grain or a wheat or anything like that. It's gluten free, but it's got a decent amount of calories. It's got a decent amount of protein to it. It makes for good fodder. And so I just started to broadcast a whole bunch of buckwheat as well as a little bit of leftover oats that I had. And so the ground in there is just completely covered in buckwheat and oats. It hasn't quite germinated yet, but I've found that it usually takes about a week for that stuff to get going. And so I'm just watering it regularly and getting it up and running. Running. Once that stuff starts to sprout too, I'm gonna let it grow all season and hopefully let it just keep growing and growing and growing. And eventually what's gonna happen is I'm gonna send my birds back in here and I'm gonna have them go in and mow it down and they will trample the grasses. Those grasses will ultimately turn into straw, which is basically gonna be 
the foundational layer of bedding. They're also gonna have all those buckwheat groats, which are like the little seed heads that sit on top and they'll eat those and so that'll be a feed as well. And so I'm not even gonna bother harvesting it. I'm just gonna let the birds do that part for me. And for the little patches of oats, the same thing goes as well. So inside there, like I said, we've got pumpkins, we've got the buckwheat, we've got the oats. And like I referenced earlier too, I also threw a few extra cabbage plants that I had started for the garden that we didn't use. And so there'll be cabbage in there. But then the last thing and maybe weirdest thing that I did is, you know, whenever you start your own seedlings, you're always buying seed packs and inevitably you'll have leftover seed. And so so I decided to just mix all those leftover seeds together and then I just started broadcast seeding them all over the place here. Now you might be wondering what do you actually call a method of gardening like that where you just take a bunch of random seeds and toss it around like that? In a word? chaos. Yes, that is right. I have decided to implement a small little patch of chaos garden right around here. This could turn into absolutely nothing. It could turn into something pretty cool. It's a mixture of lettuce seeds, kale seeds, beans, peas, just a whole bunch of stuff that I just tossed out there just to see what would happen. And I don't know what will happen, but over the course of the summer, you guys will get to watch this whole experiment unfold. I'm hoping to get some interesting random things germinating in there. And again, that just becomes more food for my animals but i don't know and only time will tell now you might be also noticing on the side here i've got just like these random hay bales scattered this is all leftover hay from our winter that i was feeding my cattle but i had surplus bales i'm now letting them sit here to sort of dry out for a little bit i'm turning them as well and so essentially they're composting and breaking down too but i'm also starting to spread them out on the ground and basically make a cover what I don't want is the bare ground like you see here. And eventually I want everything just covered in a pile of mulch. And then as things progress over the course of the summer, eventually I'll start to broadcast seed it with something like a winter rye. Again, just adding more diversity of the plant life that we have here on the farm. Hey, Piggly Wigglies, how's it going? They probably want me to feed them. Would you look at this Toby dog? Would you guys look at this Toby dog? I've been working on trying to get Abby to be less of an attention hound. Abby, sit, good girl. You stay right there. Toby gets his petting time. Eventually you'll get petting time too, don't worry Abby. But no, Toby gets the love right now, yes but yeah. There is something hysterical to me about pig noises. I just don't know what to say about it. All right, let's put out the weird chickens. Good morning, weird chickens. So yeah, the weird chickens are staying in their weird chicken house. I've got them inside this chicken tractor right now just for their own protection. Still working on their long-term housing plans. And like I said, there's gonna be some changes with the weird chickens that I'll talk about in a future video. All right, Toby Dog, you wanna go visit your birds? Let's go. There you go, buddy. No, Abby, I'm gonna have you wait here. This is Toby Dog's time to shine. Oh, Toby Dog's already heading up the hill. So yes, the birds have been here in the permaculture orchard. I mean, it's interesting. You can see right here, they've really hit a lot of this stuff pretty hard already. I don't know why this keeps leaking. At least let me just catch the water in there. Yeah, my watering system is working well, but one of the things that I'm realizing is I need to find a way to make this more mobile. You know, I experimented in building this thingy, but it's kind of heavy and hard to move. And so because I'm seeing just how much of an impact the birds make wherever I have their water and shelter, where like right here, you can see it's just really beaten down, but then over there, it's like almost completely untouched. I realize I'm gonna need to come up with a way to make my watering system more mobile. So that's definitely a future project here on the farm. I don't have any like immediate plans for it just yet, but stick with me and eventually you'll see something come of it. Hey, Ron Swanson, you're enjoying that water? Don't mean to scare you, I'm just moving the hose. But I mean, you can see like areas like this are just completely caked with duck poop and goose poop. And yes, there's a difference. The browner stuff is actually the duck poop. The green stuff, which is, you know, now most of their diet is grass, is the goose poop. I gotta buy a couple more of these. They're super handy. They're really expensive for just a special piece of plastic. But what's so great about them is you can just like hot swap your different hoses. And now the water trough for the girls is filling up, so can't fault it. I'm just writing myself a note to order a couple more right now. <laughs> I have lots of random thoughts that happen to me while I'm working here on the farm and so I'm always like jotting them down on my phone. Having good note-taking tools is like inevitably important if you're gonna run a farm. Wow, would you look at those geese chowing down on that grass? I love seeing that. And then I also love seeing happy ducks going for a swim. Hey, 
Age of Mima puddle though. You guys hear that? Like a duck quacking far off in the distance. I see Toby wandering around. Like he's right there. Right there. And I bet you he disrupted her nest. I've noticed a couple of my ducks have started to vanish and they're probably leaving nests somewhere around the permaculture orchard. So for example, right now you can see generic duck who's right there. She's that black and white Cayuga duck. She's one of our older Cayugas. Here comes that cranky duck. You're missing out on the party with everybody else there, girl. Now I'm gonna go put out the feed for the birds right now. Watch, everybody's gonna follow me in like just this massive, amazing line. It's pretty incredible to see. Yeah, I keep moving their food dishes and food placement so that they keep moving around different parts of the pasture. I have this feed bin stash right here to make it easy to give them their food and start the daily feeding frenzy. Yeah, you can definitely see that the ducks are the ones that hit it hard. Like you have a couple of geese that like to try to get in on the mix. But the ducks are the ones who really want to feed. Hey look, there's Frank from Frank and Bean. How's it going, Frankie? At this point, I'm finding that I'm feeding them about half of what I would feed them in the winter months. It's looking like the mulberry trees are starting to come out finally. You know, it's funny, the mulberries seem to be the latest of my trees that like always seem to get their leaves later than everybody else. These mulberries are doing great. I mean, this tree right here is, I don't know, maybe about 12 feet now. It's coming along. I had like two trees that had mulberries last year in the permaculture orchard. I bet you get a bunch more this year. I think the real question here is, will the wild birds eat these mulberries before I get to? Good morning, Bonnie. Good morning, Belinda. How are you both? So yes, my heifers are doing good. They're right here in this corner. They still seem like they miss their moms a little bit, but it's a little bit less so. Bonnie McMurray, would you like some? Belinda Carlisle is way more sociable than Bonnie McMurray. Your mom is my most sociable cow. I don't know how you're the least sociable. There you go, Belinda. Good girl. Don't knock over the camera, girls. So as you guys can see here, I finally caved and got a float valve. And so the way this works is the water hydrant that I was just filling up the duck water with, I just swapped hoses and that hose runs all the way down to that spigot down at the bottom of the hill. But now what happens is when water gets drunk, like Mr. Toby Dog's drinking water here, right now it has like a little thing in here that as the water level decreases it will open and close the valve that'll feed the hose and so i doubt toby's gonna drink enough to turn it on but let's see the girls are like what are you doing you know as toby dog stays up here more and more one of the things he's learning is the duck water is kind of gross the cow water tastes pretty darn good all right so he didn't turn it on but here let me show you do a demonstration for you here Hear it? That's the water shooting back in as the level goes under it. I don't keep water running to it at all times, but I have a similar float valve now installed with the adult cows. And so what happens is, is when I turn on my whole watering system, both this trough and that trough will completely fill up. And so I'll do it like maybe once or twice a day. I actually like using these smaller troughs versus the bigger ones that I used to use last year, because I find that with these girls, they always want more fresh water because there's only two of them. But then with the other herd, what I find is it's easier to move it on a daily basis. And so, yeah, it's just a better infrastructure for daily grazing. Now, Belinda, if you would only let me brush you, I could get that stray hair that's all at the bottom of you. Just one day, Belinda, just watch. You're gonna be letting me milk you, I bet. So now the girls do have neighbors. I see one not good sign. Oh boy, that's not good at all. So Joey Ramon, who's actually Bonnie and Belinda's brother, he's our steer and he seems like he's loose in the pasture right now. Macho Man is still where he should be. He's a very good, well-behaved boy, but I think we're gonna go have to deal with this. I mean, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. I don't see him anywhere. The cows are over there, so my guess is he's probably over there. All right, Abby, hey ho, let's go. We gotta find Joey Ramon. It's very hard to actually pedal and do the camera and carry a bucket of treats. So I'm just gonna take a couple of these in my pocket because this is how I'm gonna entice them. Let's see if we can't bring our boy back here. And just for the record, this is why it's so important to have a good perimeter fence. The reason you guys don't see me panicking about this situation is because I know eventually I'm gonna find him. He's somewhere in this pasture. How are my chickens doing, huh? I gotta move you guys to a fresh paddock pretty soon. I know that's for sure. You can see their manure starting to build up. I'll probably move them tonight. I'm just waiting on, I don't know what I'm waiting on. <laughs> I should move them tonight. 
You can actually see a couple of them are starting to go through their molt. Like this gal right here, she's molting. And I'm pretty sure Carmen is molting. Yeah, you can see it. She's starting to molt as well. Let's grab some eggs. Somebody's starting to poop in here. I gotta clean this and come get this later when I have the ATV. It's very hard to carry a basket of eggs and keep them all intact when you're riding a bike along a pasture. I think I've identified the location of our boy. Can you see him? He's actually right over by the cows, just outside their fence. To the farm bike! Excuse me, Mr. Joey Ramon. What you doing over here, huh? Are you trying to visit with your mom and your aunties? You left your buddy Randy all alone. I don't think he appreciates that. See if I can give him a gentle nudge back in the direction where I want him. Come on, Joe. I don't want him to think I'm trying to headbutt him though. That could be very dangerous for me. All right, let's try to do this on foot. In case you're wondering, my kickstand broke off. I gotta fix it. I know, I know. Come on, I got what you need. Come on, buddy. Come with me. We got a little bit of a walk, but let's go. Come on. All right, he's coming with me, but I think this is gonna take a little time. A few minutes later. A little longer than a few minutes later. I look at those geese. Come on, Joey. Let's keep going. Come on, Joey. Follow along. One eternity later. Well, this job is not for those who are impatient. Let me just tell you. I don't know. It just took me, gosh, 25 minutes or so to get him across the pasture. But now he's back with his buddy and they're doing good. Getting to eat the remnants of the alfalfa snacks. I'm pretty sure actually the reason he snuck out was he probably stopped to go visit his sisters and that was the temptation. And then once he was free, he started to just explore and roam. I don't know. This is a less than ideal circumstance. I really wanted both of these guys to be able to get some fresh grass because we have so much fresh grass right now. But hopefully he doesn't keep escaping. It's really going to be only a, I don't know, a week or two before I can mix these guys in if I really needed to. And so, I don't know, let's see how this holds up. I might put up a second line of rope just to try to discourage that type of activity. Abby, and sometimes you were helpful and sometimes you were not. So you get a mixed grade today. I'm still working on training Abby for up here in the pasture. I also have this technology tool, which I'll talk about definitely in a future video, but I'm just not ready yet that I'm working with to try to make sure she doesn't go where she shouldn't. I'll just leave it at that. But it's actually proving to be a bit trickier than I expected it to be, which is probably also a good answer for any folks who just watch that whole sequence and saying, oh, you should get a border collie or an Australian shepherd or some sort of herding dog. And the reality is I could, but then that's a whole nother animal I have to plan for. That's a whole bunch of other training I have to go for. I just don't necessarily want to tackle that project yet. That's not to say never, but I don't want to just jump right into it. I think so often people will see things with farms and homesteads and say, oh, you just got to get this thing and then just do it. But usually with any other tool or animal you add to the farm, there's always a learning curve. There's always maintenance work. There's always management work, particularly with the animals that you got to take into consideration before you take that step. And so I know I'm gonna see a, you should just get a, and then insert your favorite type of herding dog into the comments. But one thing that doing this over a couple of years has taught me is it's never just. You know, whenever you take a step like that, there's usually about a dozen other needs, steps, actions, and activities that you have to take beyond that. There is a hole in the bucket, dear Liza, dear Liza. And speaking of buckets, I don't want you to gorge yourself. Get the bloat. As you can see here, I've been keeping up with my fly trapping and it's actually been pretty darn effective. I'm gonna change this fly paper probably later today, but this was really only one week's worth of flies. And the cattle are looking really good. I think the secret really is rapid movement, chickens, trapping. If you keep doing those things and you stay on top of it, you stay on top of your fly problem. Hey, Kios, come on, Kios. Fresh grass, fresh grass, come on, Kios. Hey, Kios, come on, Kios. Fresh grass, fresh grass, come on. I love this part. Morning, girls. How are you doing? Give us this day our daily slot. Yes, the girls are going crazy for their food. They are getting bigger and bigger. I don't know if you guys can tell, but if you look at how they were, say, I don't know, a month ago versus now, it's pretty impressive how quickly they've grown. Don't eat my boots, please. Excuse me, back off, personal space. Talking to you, Phil Leotardo. You know, the one thing I will say is my goal was to have them eating 
90% of like waste food. And I think I'm a bit below that. I'd say it's, I'd have to look at the exact numbers, but I'm gonna guess it's somewhere around 70% of their food is coming from waste. So like old vegetables, uh, food scraps, uh, the brewer's grains, which is probably the biggest part of their diet. I'm working on coming up with some additional supplies of food, but yeah, that's like one thing that I'm like, oh gosh, I wish I could do it a little bit better is keep feeding them more waste product. <laughs> you know, I got a new surprise for you too. Yeah, I think you're gonna be hanging out in this spot all summer long. So yesterday I just finished planting out this space. What this is gonna be is my catnip bed garden. And I don't know, maybe catnip bed garden is kind of redundant. Catnip bed or catnip garden, but it can't be a bed garden, I guess. Could be a garden bed. Please, 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 Abby, stay out of it, please. No, Toby, you too, please stay out of it. So yes, last night I broadcast a whole bunch of catnip seed into here. It's supposed to rain later today. Really not a big deal that the dogs are in it right now, but I got to figure out a longer term solution. But I'm hoping to sprout a whole bunch of catnip right in this area. My goal is twofold, right? So as you can see, Molly Murder Mittens is playing with that grass, but I bet she'd much rather play with some catnip. And then part two is I might make it a new farm product. And I mean, like who wouldn't want Pablo Escobar or Molly Murder Mittens branded catnip, right? By the way, I don't get credit for that idea. My sister, I think, was the one who first came up with it or first suggested it to me and it got my gears going. But yeah, basically right here, you'll see some catnip growing. I'm sure the cats will be hanging out here. And then yeah, come fall, I'll harvest it, probably dry it in the big barn, then put it on sale, I don't know, maybe in the winter ish months when I have more time to handle that sort of stuff. Toby's like, why isn't there dog nip? I wish there was dog nip. Let loose the goose! So yes, the goslings are on our farm, are thriving. We have actually three age groups of goslings now all living together. The youngest ones are about, I don't know, eight days old now. The oldest ones are a little bit shy of four weeks. I wanna say they're like, yeah, three and a half weeks or so. You know, it's funny, the other day I actually mixed all my gosling groups together. I took the ones that were just recently hatched They've been living inside for a couple of days just to get a little bit of strength. And once they got that strength, I put them in with everybody else and they're doing spectacular. You know, so far this year, and I'm gonna keep knocking on wood here, I only lost one gosling. It was actually the gosling that I did an assisted hatch with at the end of the video where I talked about all my weight loss stuff. That little one sadly died. Everybody else is doing great, including the four other ones that we did assisted hatches with. Those four extra ones actually stayed inside a little bit longer, as you guys have seen in previous videos, but now they're out there with everybody else. Everybody's thriving, everybody's doing good. It's still a little bit too cold at night for me to want to actually pull the oldest of the goslings out and start putting them in a chicken tractor. I don't know what I'm gonna do. I've got another class of goslings that actually just pit inside, and so they'll probably be fully hatched in about a day or two, and then once they hatch, I'll probably keep them inside for another two or three days, and then bring them outside. I'm liking this this system that I'm developing where you can have multiple age groups living together, it's just giving them just a little bit something extra that first couple of days so that they don't get squashed or trampled. But once they come up of size, I'm finding that they can mix in with pretty much any age of gosling. And very soon in a future video, you guys will probably see four age groups of goslings all between a week and 10 days apart living together. I think it's gonna be very cool to see. Now, one thing though that's worth recognizing is I have been growing this oat grass for them for the last couple of weeks. I figured today would be a good day to let them have at it. The oat seed that's here is actually the same oat seed that I sowed in there. And so picture this stuff just growing much, much higher. That's what ultimately my birds are gonna discover in the fall. Hey little ones, I got a surprise for you. I mean, as you can see, so this is the oat grass. I think this stuff is actually amaranth, but all of this is stuff that they can eat. And so, Let's let them get on some greens, huh?